As you mentioned, uh, one of my favorite things, I love reading books about the history of science. Yeah, thanks. Go ahead for the other one, too. Oh, it's here. <laughs> now my laser will show up. Uh, so one of the things I love to do is I love reading about the history of astronomy, or science, especially astronomy. Um, and I've probably reread this book called Watchers, or Blind Watchers of the Sky. Brad, you know that one. Um, in fact, I still have your book. Okay. Uh, <laughs> That's where it was. <laughs> That's where it was. It, it, it talks about, you know, the history of how we've come to our understanding of the universe today. Uh, now, that's not what I'm, what I'm going to be talking about, but how we started understanding our place in the universe, uh, this is one of the byproducts of that happening. Um, so, I'm going to be talking about how Neptune was discovered. Neptune was the first uh, planetary or solar system body that was discovered not by empirical observations, like us looking at something in the sky and saying, hey, look, that's something new, like a comet or an asteroid or whatever. Neptune was discovered based on mathematical prediction. And I'm going to be talking about how that happened um, and kind of the buildup of how we got to the point where we can do this kind of thing. So, why this topic? Well, I'm fascinated with science history. Um, especially with astronomy, as I mentioned. Um, so, since I, I, I read and I study the history of science, some of my scientific heroes, like uh, Copernicus, Kepler, which is probably um, my biggest scientific hero, and there's a reason why. Kepler, when he was learning about planetary motions, or the, the motions of the uh, solar system bodies, he had a preconceived notion of how it should have looked. The evidence didn't point that way. So Kepler did this amazing thing and said, I'm going to throw out my hypothesis because the data, I'm not going to fit my or I'm not going to fit the data into my hypothesis. So he threw out his hypothesis and came up with what became to be known as his laws of planetary motion. So that is something that's crucial in science. A lot of times we're human beings, we walk into things with our own biases of how we think uh, things should be. But when the data contradicts that, sometimes we have a natural tendency to fit the data to our preconceived ideas. But science doesn't work that way, because someone's going to be out there and they're going to try to disprove it. In fact, that's the thing. Science is all about disproving hypotheses, not proving them, but disproving them. So Kepler was like one of those individuals that said, this doesn't work, it must be something else. And guess what? He got closer to the truth uh, by doing that. So, sorry about the little aside on Kepler, but he's my favorite uh, scientific hero. So, um, some of the things I love to do, I love it when something new comes out and allows us to uh, build upon it to come up with new discoveries. Like his planetary uh, laws of planetary motion, Newton's law, uh, uh, Newtonian mechanics, uh, relativity, and how relativity helped us to predict. Uh, more accurately, how gravity works with uh, with bodies and, or with masses in the universe. So those kinds of things I kind of like. I love it when there's something new that kind of forks the road. Like when they started discovering quantum mechanics, um, that's also fascinating to me. That allowed us to you know create computers and things like that. So all of these key points in science that essentially put humanity on a, an interesting trajectory to further us along in our, uh, in our development. Also, Neptune's my favorite planet. Um, I think it's because I like the color blue. When I was a kid, it was blue. So, um, And this book right here by uh, Tom Standage uh, is what inspired this talk. I've read it a couple times already, but I thought, well, that's interesting, because I just got done reading it, and I suggested it in one of our board meetings. like, why don't I do a talk about this? Because there's a, it's kind of a, it was a contentious thing of what happened when it was discovered. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. So um, Tom Sandage, he is a senior editor at The Economist. And uh, he wrote uh, another book that is one of my favorite books called The Victorian Internet. Um, I highly recommend that book as well. It talks about how a lot of people think the internet today is like, oh, it's this revolutionary thing that's never happened before. And the telegraph network that began in the 1800s 
a lot of the dynamics and the things we see today of how the internet is affecting society and the world as a whole already happened before when we had the telegraph network. That, that fast, moving, um, uh, fast moving information um, allowed a lot of things to happen. And again, this is one of those things. This was something that happened that put us on a trajectory that, that furthered us along as, uh, uh, as society grows. Anyway. All right, so we all know about the planet. So since a long time ago, humans, when they looked up in the sky, they noticed that not all the stars are staying in place. They wander around in the sky. A lot of uh, early cultures uh, interpreted it as some kind of uh, a, a divinity or some kind of a, a stellar messenger or something like that. They didn't know what they were, but they just knew that they moved around the sky, but the other stars stayed put. So they were like, hey, this is interesting. So we've known about uh, five planets that you can see with the naked eye. And that, of course, is Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter and Saturn, some people say, well, you can see Earth. All right, you're being a smart lady. <laughs> so, anyway, so the, the name planet came from a Greek term, and I'm going to butcher this, but I'm going to say it anyway. Astros planetai, which literally, does that sound right? Okay. okay. That literally means wandering stars. So planets wander. How do they wander? Well, they have this thing called a retrograde motion. The inner planets don't really experience this because we only see those during the sunrise and the sunset. So when you see the evening star, the morning star, that's Venus. It will never ever be on the opposite side of the sky. It will always stay close to where the sun is because they are inside the solar system, or inside the orbit of Earth. However, the outer planets have this retrograde motion. And the way this happens is, you know, when I go on an on-ramp, every time I go on an on-ramp, you know the one that goes around like this? and I see like a, a sign, and I see the, something behind it, I always look at that and I'm like, oh, there's a retrograde motion because I'm catching up to the sign. Same thing with, um, you guys do that too, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe it's just me. <laughs> so the way it works is as an inner planet is going around its orbit, and you have a planet outside of that, and any of the outer planets does, it will do this. It just depends on... Um, how far away or how close it is depends on how much of a retrograde motion you'll see and how often it does this during the year. So what you'll see here, like in position one, right? So say this is Earth and that's Mars. It's right there, right? As the Earth starts catching up with Mars, it starts overtaking it, the, pers the perspective or using the background stars, it appears to stop and it starts going backwards again. And then as the Earth goes around and it's, uh, and it's surpassing it, uh, the planet in its orbit, it'll start going back in the same direction again. That's called a retrograde motion. Astronomers and uh, ancient humans noticed this. They just didn't know what to make of it. The various philosophers and astronomers uh, tried to come up with explanations. There's this thing called the geocentric model. Uh, so you have, uh, you know, a lot of people think of uh, Ptolemy came up with it, but it's actually something that was uh, proposed earlier than uh, uh, Hippar Hipparchus? Hipparchus. Hipparchus and Ptolemy. There was a guy named Apollo Apollonius. Apollonius. Sounds kind of funny. Um, he kind of came up with this idea, and it was further developed by Parkos and Ptolemy uh, afterwards. And this was kind of the dominating solar system model uh, all the way up to the 17th century. And I thought that was kind of a neat looking uh, representation of these, these, these uh, the retrograde motions of the planets from the perspective if you're looking down at Earth. So this is the geocentric model. Then comes Copernicus. One of my heroes. He came up with a heliocentric model. Well, let me, I take that back. He didn't come up with it. It was known, but one, the church didn't like it because the earth wasn't the center of the universe. And two, um, he could have gotten in a lot of trouble by doing this. Um, so this was actually known. Um, Aristarchus came up with this idea back in the uh, early century, in like the third century BC, uh, BCE. 
And so he kind of um, developed it more. And really, he came up with this because the math fit better. It was better, they were always trying to predict where the planets are going to be. Most of the motivation was for astrology purpose because kings would pay astronomers to predict their future. So knowing where the planets are going to be in the sky at a particular uh, point in time was important at that time. Well, he came up with this idea. It's like, well, if we do it this way, the math is easier to deal with. Because the other way, you have all these different circles, and it, it, it was just a really hard uh, time to make these uh, astronomical tables to predict where these planets are going to be. So this kind of fit better. I don't think he really knew if this was the way it was. He's thinking, well, this is a better model to do this. Then comes my, my main hero. Uh, I didn't like Tico too much. Um, he's kind of an arrogant guy. He liked to party a lot. Um, there's a lot of stories about his parties. So between 1609 and 1619, Kepler started using Tico's data. T Tico was a, he wasn't a good theor or a theoretical scientist. He was more of an observational scientist. He took very good notes of positions of the planets. Now, this is before the invention of the telescope, right? Now, actually, no, yeah, it was. Tycho's data was before the invention of the telescope. So using Tycho's data, uh, Kepler was able to come up with his planetary or his laws of planetary motion. Um, as I mentioned earlier, he kind of had a, an idea of what he thought it should be, but the data didn't fit, so he came up with something new. Now, there's three uh, main points to his uh, uh, laws of planetary motion. One, in orbit of a planet is really an ellipse, and there are two focal points of, uh, of where that ellipse happens. Now, so you have like the sun on one side and the earth on the other. Now, the point of the Earth and the Sun, now they're not farther, I, I, I don't want to just go to the next slide, here we go. So, you'll see two focal points here, right? And then the planet's going around two uh, focal points, this is an ellipse, okay? So his first law talks about how these planets orbit in an ellipse. The second law talks about shaded areas, the time it takes for this planet to go from here to here, and from here to here, the area of these two angles are equal. So as the planet goes closer to the first focal point, it goes a little faster. As it goes out, it goes a little slower. So that's the second law. Third law I'm not very familiar with. Just know that the total orbit times for planet one and then planet two have this ratio. And this really kind of goes into like into effect where it's like this planet and this planet, there's a ratio between the amount of times this planet orbits and then the second planet orbits and then the third planet orbits, etc. Um, so that's the formula that he came up with. Then comes the big guy, Sir Isaac Newton. Uh, I'm not going to go into uh, Newtonian mechanics, just know that he introduced the concept of gravity. And uh, his uh, the mathematical principles of natural philosophy, which is this here in Latin, uh, essentially describe Newtonian mechanics. He described the concept of gravity and the attraction of, uh, of massive bodies in the universe. So you combine Kepler's planetary uh, laws of motion and Newton's Newtonian mechanics, they were coming up with better astronomical tables to predict where the planets are going to be in the future. This is very important because they use these astronomical tables. Back then, they like to find out where things were in the sky so they can tell a king that they're going to be king for another year. But what's really took, what really took off with these astronomical tables is uh, navigation at sea. Uh, a lot of uh, uh, mariners were using these astronomical tables to try to determine like, latitude is very easy to determine. You look where the North Star is, and you say, okay, I am at this degree of latitude because the North Star is this far above the horizon. Longitude was very difficult. Because they didn't have accurate clocks, because the way you determine your longitude is you have a clock, in, and they decided it was Greenwich, England. That's why GMT time, or Zulu time, is there. What they would do is they would take Zulu time and subtract it from local time, and using that, they can find out how far away east or west they are from the meridian. 
And that's how they would determine where they were from a longitudinal, is that a word? From a, from a longitude perspective. Um, is that, I don't know. Just call me George Bush. Bush. Um, so these astronomical tables were used, they, they were trying to use astronomical bodies to try to determine where they are from a longitude, from a longitude perspective. I wouldn't even want to try to say that again. <laughs> so, before we talk about the discovery of Neptune, we need to talk about the discovery of Uranus. So, Sir William Herschel, which is a very famous um, uh, astronomer, he was a musician, and he decided he wanted to do astronomy, so he stopped playing music. Um, so he's credited for actually discovering the planet. The planet was, actually, this was discovered before, but everyone thought it was a star. In fact, uh, Clancy, who uh, made the, uh, the, the catalog of stars where there's a number next to them, um, he called it, what was it, 34 Tauri. So he saw it in 1690, but didn't know it was a planet. Now, when Herschel was looking at it, he's looking at it, I was like, this, this kind of looks different. He thought it was a comet originally. But it wasn't moving as fast, and also he's like, oh, maybe it's a nebulous star. But he uh, finally, they finally determined that it was a planet, and uh, he's credited as the discoverer of it. He actually wanted to call it Georgium Sidus, George's star after George III. Because you know, George III was paying his salary, so he wanted to honor <laughs> his boss by naming a planet after him. So nowadays you can just name it a star after your boss. No, I'm kidding. That's a whole other subject. Don't name it a star after him. Um, so anyway, so the discovery of Uranus is very important to how Neptune was discovered. Remember, I was talking about those astronomical tables. Well, there was a French astronomer by the name of Alexis Boulevard. He produced these astronomical tables for the planets, and he was doing one for Uranus. There was a problem. The prediction of where Uranus was going to be in the sky wasn't coinciding with where the prediction would be based on these astronomical tables. So he theorized that there was something out there that was tugging on Uranus. So this is an illustration of that. As Uranus is going along, it's getting attracted by this uh, other planet, this planet X, or planet beyond Uranus. It would make it go a little faster, and then as it's going this way, it would tug on it so it would be slower. So they're seeing these discrepancies in these astronomical tables. The observational data wasn't coinciding with the prediction from the astronomical table. So he was thinking that there was an object beyond Uranus that is causing Uranus not to behave right. So John Couch Adams was an English astronomer. So in 1844, he started trying to determine mathematically, well, if there is a body out there, where will it be in the sky at a particular time? So he was using data that Sir George Airy, Airy, by the way, is the guy that said, oh, you won't get this, uh, this fuzzy dot when you look at a star. And I'm probably saying this completely wrong. But they call it the Airy disk because he said it wouldn't happen, and it does. So that's a way to say, ha, you were wrong, so we're going to name it after you. <laughs> so that's, that is Sir George Airy. So <laughs> telescope makers know what the Airy disk is so that, you know, as you star testing. Um, so using data provided by uh, Airy between 1845 and 1846, he was able to try to come up with some predictions of where Uranus may be. At the same time, this French guy, Urban Le Verrier, he was working independently on these same calculations, you know, without Adams' knowledge, and Adams didn't know that he was doing it, he didn't know Adams was doing it. As soon as the, the word was out because Leverrier published his estimates. Um, Airy persuaded uh, this astronomer here, his name is James Chalice, to start looking for the new uh, planet. So the race was on. The French didn't like the English. The English didn't like the French. So there was a race, a space race, if you will, to try to predict and discover where this elusive planet was going to be. So, as Chalice is sitting there trying to find this planet using Adams' data, uh, 
Leverrier urged uh, the Berlin Observatory, the director of the uh, Berlin Observatory, Johann Gottfried Guy, to use the, the observatory's refractor to try to find this planet. So Chalice is in England looking for the planet. Now there are astronomers in Berlin looking for the planet. The Berlin Observatory had an advantage. So there was a student there by the name of Heinrich Dares, and that's him right there. By the way, that's the uh, director, Gottfried Galle. Berlin had some recently drawn star charts of that region where the prediction was going to be. The prediction was, at the time, between the constellations of Aquarius and uh, Capricornus. They had a recently drawn star chart there, and the student over there, the rest, said, why don't we take the star charts, compare that to what we're seeing in the eyepiece, and look for something that's different. And that's how they found it. In fact, this is the very star chart where, and I got a bigger version of that, this is the star chart that was done at um, the Berlin Observatory. And here is where it was predicted. And this is where they found it. So, kind of neat. So the day that uh, the rest sent that Gottfried Galle got the letter, he discovered uh, that kind of neat. So Le Verrier's um, prediction was much closer. It was at one degree off of where it actually was. Adams was about 12 degrees off. This is, I went into the Sky X and I pulled back the timer to 23rd September 1846. And that's where Neptune was. And this is uh, Capricorn over here and this is Aquarius up here. So Neptune was discovered at this point in time. I bet you they took their telescope and looked at Saturn just for good measure because Saturn's so beautiful to look at. So that's kind of neat though, that Saturn was very close to where Neptune was. And this is the, uh, the actual telescope that was uh, used. It's not at the Berlin Observatory anymore. It's in a uh, museum in Munich. Um, I believe it's in Munich. Um, this is the actual, they call it the Neptune telescope. That's the telescope with the refractor that discovered uh, Neptune. All right, so cat's out of the bag. Neptune's discovered. Some astronomers in uh, Airy and Chalice in uh, England is trying to say, we discovered it. And of course, Le Verrier is saying that we discovered it in, con in conjunction or in collaboration with the Berlin Observatory. So there was an intense rivalry between the French and the English. So an international consensus said, hey, you know what? They both get credit of discovery. However, Adams, so Le Verrier was pretty arrogant. He was French. Uh -huh. No, he, sorry. I just wanted to sound like a French person. Um, so, anyways, Le Verrier uh, was saying, well, I discovered it. Adams, who was pretty diminutive, he was a pretty humble guy, he's like, you know what? Um, this is his quote. Um, I won't read it all, but right here, this is the part I want to read. For there is no doubt that his researches were first published to the world and led to the actual discovery of the planet by Dr. Galloway. So, so that the fact stated above cannot detract in the slightest degree from the credit due to Messier Le Verrier. So Adam was pretty humble about it. He was like, look, this guy discovered it. I didn't discover it. He got to it first. I didn't. However, there were a lot of... Uh, uh, frustration and anger towards Airy and Chalice because Adams wasn't really well known. At first they thought, well, this is kind of a curiosity. As soon as the French started really nailing down that something was out there, that's when Airy and Chalice were like, we got to do something about this. They didn't take it seriously at first. So, um, so they were criticized for their failure to mentor Adams to pursue this curiosity. Uh, Chalice was pretty, you know, he was upset about it. He's like, yeah, you're right. I did something wrong. Harry was kind of an arrogant guy, you know, hence the Harry disc thing. Harry uh, pretty much tried to defend his role to the end. Uh, in 1966, uh, Dennis Rollins started questioning the, uh, the claims that Adam uh, was the discoverer, discoverer of it, or the co-discoverer of it. And then there were these papers that were found in Chile um, called the Neptune Papers, and it has correspondence between all these astronomers. 
So based on the research that historians have done looking at that data or looking at the correspondence between everyone, they're pretty much saying Adams does not uh, uh, deserve equal credit. And to be honest, Adams agreed. He was not trying to make a name for himself. I think a lot of people thought that uh, Chalice and Barry uh, really failed to take it seriously until they found out the French were taking it seriously. Then they started taking it seriously. And poor Adams was caught in the middle. So, planets discovered. Credit is, uh, is given. So, um, at the time they didn't really have a name, so they just started calling it the planet beyond Uranus, or Le Verrier's planet. Uh, Leverrier uh, proposed to call it Neptune. Uh, other uh, proposals were Janus and Oceanus. Um, at one time, Leverrier said, you know what, I think we should name it after me. And uh, of course, the French were all over that. They're like, oh, yeah, we want to name it after you. And then of course, in uh, England, they're like, and everywhere else in the world, they're going, no way, we're not naming this after anyone. So eventually they came up with the, uh, the planet Neptune, uh, coinciding with how the rest of the planets have uh, Roman uh, god names, they assign it. Uh, one year on Neptune is 164.8 Earth years. It spins at 16.11 hours, uh, one rotation. Uh, it is, um, is it's, I might get this wrong, it is smaller than Uranus, but it's more massive than um, it's 7.8 to 8.0, so you cannot see it with your naked eye. Uranus you can see with the naked eye, but it's very difficult. I've seen it before, but it's not very bright. Um, you just got to know where to look for it. Uh, so Neptune you cannot see unless you're using a telescope. Um, I have seen Neptune several times. It's fun to look at. It looks like a little pale bluish green dot. Uh, they have four, it has 14 known satellites, and its largest satellite is the moon Triton. Uh, it's mostly made up of hydrogen, helium, and methane, and the uh, ices involved are ammonia water. Um, uh, so it's mostly ammonia water and a little bit of ammonium hydrosulfide. <coughs> now, why is, oh, I'm, I'll get to that next. So here's this thing that they discovered and didn't know about until Voyager passed by um, in 1989. It had this large spot on it. Just like Jupiter has the great red spot, this had the great uh, dark spot. Now, they found out that it eventually went away in 1994 because they were using the Hubble Space Telescope to monitor it, and it disappeared. So the white clouds you see here is mostly composed of methane ice. It's kind of like cirrus clouds here on Earth. You know, those wispy clouds up real high is made of water ice. The cirrus clouds on Neptune are made of methane ice. So another thing is, why is Neptune blue? Well, it's mostly made up of hydrogen, helium, and methane. The methane, uh, and there's not as enough methane in it as there is in Uranus, because Uranus is like has a pale greenish color, uh, but it still absorbs the red light, and it allows the blue light to reflect more prominently than any other uh, parts of the uh, spectrum. So, um, but anyway, that's it. And by the way, that is the symbol for Neptune. Um, and that's it. Do you have any questions? This is, I wish this was a clear night, because then we can go out there and observe. I kind of blew through this, didn't I? No, that's not too bad. So, any questions? have an estimate of mass and distance. Mm -hmm. Do they do they have any reason to to have those estimates? So they were deriving like the mass of how much it was being tough. Right? But that's going to be dependent on how far away it is too. That's right. But they can kind of uh, they were using like a range. I mean they couldn't say like well it's definitely this much. So they'd go well if it's this or this massive it could tug this much. If it's this massive, it could tug this much. In fact, we're doing this right now. They're thinking, because Neptune is being pulled in a certain way, there's actually a hypothetical planet X out there right now that they're looking at. So they're kind of using the same kind of techniques. Now we have powerful computers that can go through that. But um, by the amount of pull and how massive something is, and also remember Kepler's laws about the rotations of, uh, or the orbits of planets, and that ratio, so they can kind of determine by how much tug it is, um, 
and use it making the assumption that it is this far away using his third law they can kind of derive mass. Now it's not anything specifically, or it's not like definite, but it gives you a range to work with. And to be honest with you, I read that and I'm going, okay, I kind of see what it is, but I don't know how they did it. Well, that's what yeah. one was yeah. 12% so, and the other was one, one degree. Yeah, right. now that may be, uh, you know, because there was something, when I was reading the book, there was, they talked about Bode's Law, and, they, and uh, one of them didn't take it into account. So, uh, and I'm trying to think, Bode's Law, it talks about the, ro the uh, ratios of the orbits, right? The ratio of the orbits, yeah. but it, it's, just, uh, it's just an estimate, and yeah, it doesn't exactly. really hold up. Yeah, right. Because series doesn't really fit that. Correct, way. yeah. So, um, I think it's pretty fascinating that one person got it within a degree, the other person got it by 12 degrees. Now, I think Leverrier had a little more of an advantage than Adams, um, and that's one of the criticisms of Barry and Chalice, was Adams wasn't encouraged to keep pursuing it, where uh, Leverrier had the uh, encouragement of the professional society in France at, at that time uh, to allow him to pursue it more. And, and really, so the English, the reason why they're criticizing Gary and Chalice so much is you missed an opportunity for national honor by finding a new planet. You know, Herschel, who was English, found Uranus. We should have found Neptune. But they didn't take it seriously. Adams got put into obscurity, whereas Love Verrier started really finding out what's going on. And he had the professional connections. Because Leverrier was not a student. He was kind of like an area of France or a chalice of France. Adams was a student, and so he didn't have that uh, prestige uh, and reputation yet to... Because um, Arian Chalice did not want to put themselves out there on a whim and find out, oh my gosh, this, this was a, a wild goose chase. We shouldn't have done this, right? So they were cautious, and they didn't want to put their reputations on the line. Whereas Leverrier had, you know, the motivation, the drive, and the support from his countrymen to try to get him to discover it first. And that's when the English started catching up. Jay? Jason, how long does Neptune and Uranus on the same side of the solar system? The same side? So they'll pass like that. Uh, once a year. <laughs> yeah, well, because Neptune is a much slower orbit, right? So the Earth is uh, going like this. Um, you know, as Neptune moves slower, once a year we're close to Neptune, and once a year we go back around, we're close to Neptune. Yeah, but when Neptune and Uranus are going oh. around, that happens like. What? Right, so we see the outer, the farther out the planets are, the more times you see that retrograde motion, right? Yeah. You don't see it as much with Mars, and Mars, when it's in retrograde, it's a lot larger. Whereas the farther out you go, the planets start. Uh, retrograde, the circles are smaller, but and they do it more often throughout the year, whereas Mars, it's, it's I, not. A, I think what he's asking is oh. uh, how often does Uranus overtake Neptune? Right. So you get oh, Neptune. I'm sorry. Yeah. I, I don't know, actually. Okay. I'm sure we can find that out. <laughs> I'm looking yeah. it up. Uh, he's, he's looking it up. Yeah. What was the question? Uh, how, go ahead, Jay. You have to be alive during that time to see that happen. Yeah. How often does Uranus overtake Neptune? Well, uh, let me see. Neptune's 164. Yeah, and then Uranus is 86. So, that's twice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so that means that so since it's hundreds of years that people were keeping detailed records of all these planets, like every, all these other scientists could go back and look at and see where everything was every day for hundreds of years. Yeah. 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 How did they trace well, all those days? They oh, so that's actually a good computer. So they had computers back then. Did you know that? Yeah, they're called people. Yeah, they're called people. They didn't have the silicon-based computers. They had the uh, carbon-based computers. They would have rooms of people that all they did is they would take and uh, do all these calculations up. That was their job. And uh, I run a uh, amateur radio uh, astronomy net, and we talked about this at our last net. And so one of the, the folks on the net asked me, well, I wonder what if they use slide rules. 
Well, the slide rule was, uh, was invented in the early 1600s, so they did have slide rules. So as soon as they created logarithms, um, they, were, they created uh, slide rules. And so what I did, because I'm weird, I had my dad's slide rule, so I started to learn how to use it. I don't know how to use a slide rule, but I know how to do that dinner, or multiplication division on it now. <laughs> so uh, if we were talking about uh, how they might have calculated, they were using the slide rules. So, huh? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, so they had computers. Yes? Uh, all the planets that orbit the sun in the same direction, yes. and if so, why? Don, you want to take one that? <laughs> it basically goes back to how the solar system formed. The sun formed from a big ball of gas that slowly collapsed, and as it collapsed, it began to rotate. Um, it's called conservation of angular momentum. And just like how you how do you traditionally make pizza, a pizza crust, right? You start with a ball of dough, and what do you do with it? You spin it. Toss it and what? You spin it. What happens? Does it flatten out? No, yeah. It flattens out to a disk, right? Well, the solar system, the the, the nebula, the sun form from essentially did the same thing. As it's shrunk and spun, it would flatten it flattened into a disk. And that's why all the planets orbit around the sun in the same direction and relatively the same place. Now I'm hungry. <laughs> <laughs> so Isaac just found out it's 172 years that every 172 yeah. years Uranus catches up in that. Yeah, I'm just um, that's a good question. I'm sorry I wasn't hearing it right. Any other questions? That's pretty cool. Yes, sir. How many of you tell us though, was the first one used to discover this planet? It was a um, it was a 26 inch achromatic lens that they had in the uh, Berlin Observatory. So it was a pretty sizable lens, and it was a good lens too. It was actually made in France at that time. France was like the premier um, uh, maker of telescope lenses, right? So it was made in France, um, and I don't remember when it was installed. I think it was installed in the 1820s. Um, I have to double check. But a 26 inch refractor is what they discovered. So I, I love reading about the history of telescopes, too. So I would need a 26 inch refractor if I wanted to see it? No. No, no, no. I've seen that due to my 66 millimeter refractor. You can see it in binoculars. Yeah, you can see it like a star. Yep, yep, you can see it with binoculars. Why, why is Neptune your favorite planet? Uh, I said earlier because my, when I was little, so one of my first astronomy books was the Peterson's Field Guide to the Stars and Planets, and um, I remember seeing pictures of Neptune and it being blue. And my favorite color, it still is, is blue. That's the only reason why I like the planet Neptune when I was little, because it's blue. <laughs> but as I learned more about it, uh, so I would thumb through this Peterson's Field Guide all the time. I mean, I still have it and it's falling apart. Uh, and I got this in 1984, and uh, that's how I learned about stellar uh, evolution, stellar classification, which was my favorite subject in astronomy. But uh, yeah, it's because of the blues. Any other questions, anyone? All right. Well, thank you for being patient and listening to me. I wish you would clear out so we can actually go outside. Stay dry. And there should be donuts and stuff back there. If you want to join up to the club, I'm the person.